So we believe that our state is at a crossroads. The paths we choose and the choices we make in the years ahead will fundamentally determine the trajectory of economic growth, social inclusion, and ultimately the prosperity of our state, its individuals, families, and communities. We can make choices that unlock potential and opportunity, or we can leave people locked out of sharing in our state's economic fortune. The Women's Wellbeing for Index for us is about making the case for a new economic agenda that is inclusive, makes investments in California's people, and lays the foundation for broadly shared and sustained growth. And of course, it's not just about the numbers, it's also about turning those numbers into policy action. And that's why we're very excited to have such a great lineup of speakers with us today. Serena Khan at the Women's Foundation of California, who's been such a great partner and a champion for this work. Carrie Decker with JP Morgan Chase and Company. We're deeply honored that Senator Hannah Beth Jackson can join us today amid what's a very busy time this week in the Capitol. My colleague, Kristen Schumacher, Noreen Farrell with Equal Rights Advocates, Daniel Beavers with the Green Lining Institute, and Kelly Todd Griffin with the Black Women, uh, with Black Women in California Initiative. A great lineup, and we're greatly appreciative that they can all be with us today. Serena, over to you. Great, uh, thank you, Chris, so much. And welcome everybody uh, to this webinar. We're so delighted to have you all with us. Um, uh, my name again is Serena Khan, and I'm the CEO of the Women's Foundation of California. And uh, we're so delighted to be partnering with the California Budget and Policy Center on the Women's Wellbeing Index, which we launched in 2016. It was a momentous occasion uh, for us because it was the first time that we had the data to substantiate the lived on the ground reports that we've been hearing from our grant partners, allies, advocates, and other leaders in the gender justice movement for years. Um, what you'll hear today from the speakers that we have lined up is um, that the index is a really powerful tool uh, for uh, all of us who are championing gender justice, whether we are policymakers, whether we are uh, advocates, service providers, nonprofit leaders, funders, individual donors. It's really an important tool. And what we have done, um, what you'll hear from today, uh, is present some deeper analysis with the issue briefs um, that I want to also point you to. You can see them in addition to being able to download them from the Budget Center's uh, website. They're also on your control panel from the GoToWebinar um, control panel under handouts, and there's four of them there. You can download them. Um, you'll, you're among the first to see them. Um, and then, as Chris said, I just also want to remind people our live today. So hashtag California Women Thrive, CA Women Thrive, and hashtag Policy Perspectives. Um, and then the other thing I just want to uh, remind you is that during the panel. Um, that you can enter questions anytime via the questions panel in, um, in the GoToWebinar site. So, um, so with that, um, I just want to say a few words about the Women's Foundation of California. Chris has already um, uh, so well described our context in California. We're a global economy, and yet we have some of the highest poverty rates in the nation. And so uh, we have a lot to be proud of, and we still have a lot to do. Uh, one in four Californians are struggling to make ends meet. Um, the poverty rate is especially high among children, women of color, single mothers, and 40% um, of California families headed by a single mother lives in poverty. So at the Women's Foundation of California, we're investing in and connecting community leaders to change all of that. Uh, and so, you know, a big part of being able to do that is through data and research. And that's why this, um, this uh, Women's Wellbeing Index is such a critical part of our work. Um, so with that, we're really excited about the webinar ahead. Um, we have some amazing speakers, as you heard, and, um, uh, and I'm going to turn it over right now to Carrie Decker with J.P. Morgan Chase and Company, who will say a few words before we move into the panel. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Serena. And I just want to say on behalf of J.P. Morgan Chase how really honored we are and excited we are to be able to support uh, this effort into the well-being index and going deeper uh, on the economic security and employment and earnings indicia as part of your index. Um, we wholeheartedly share your view 
that when women thrive, our communities, our families, our state, and our nation prosper. Uh, and in order to thrive, we really do need to understand where are the barriers, where are we making progress, how are we making progress, broken down by geography, uh, by race and, eth and ethnicity, and of course, most importantly, to this study, by gender. Um, as one of the largest corporate foundations in California, uh, with the focus on equity and inclusive growth, um, including through a gender lens, this data-driven work is really important to us as we think through our own investment strategies and as we look to expand economic opportunity and scale promising practices across California. Um, I'll say it's also really important to inform our own programs that we have with our employees, our customers, our clients, particularly um, women. So we're very excited to be able to help underwrite this. Um, I do wanna say we're especially um, happy about the brief you have about building wealth and really focusing on the wealth gap in California. I think there's been a lot of attention for all the right reasons about the income gap. As we know, women are making 79 cents of a dollar uh, compared to men, but not as much research has been done on the wealth gap. And actually the wealth gap is far worse than the income gap. For example, uh, white women, are um, their wealth gap is basically 32 cents uh, compared to white men on the do dollar and women of color are actually pennies on the dollar. So we think that this is really critical. Obviously wealth is a term we're not always comfortable with uh, as women, but it is what allows us to invest in ourselves and in our families. You know, it's that store of resources we can use during an emergency. It's that nest egg we can leverage and really for our own children, our home and our business. Um, and of course it's, it's savings for a secure retirement. And it's no surprise that the National Institute on Retirement Security has found that women are 80% more likely than men to live in poverty in retirement. So thank you to the Budget Center, Budget and Policy Center, and thank you, Serena, to the California Women's Foundation for your really in critical work on this. We stand with you, ready to partner uh, to ensure that all women in California thrive. So thank you. Thank you so much, Carrie. Um, really, uh, thank you. We couldn't obviously do this work without you. We need the resources to um, continue updating. And, um, to analyze the data. And so that's what you'll be hearing about today. Uh, right now, I want to turn it over to Senator Hannah Beth Jackson. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And um, I know, as Chris said, it's a very busy time in the Capitol, and I know that you're traveling today. Um, so uh, thank you again for joining us, and um, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Well, thank you so much. I'm really excited uh, about this work. I'm excited that uh, uh, the Budget and Policy Center is yet again uh, providing very important information and data, data being critically important as we have these discussions so that we don't hear uh, the denial that there's anything wrong, that people have more than just anecdotal examples of why we need to do so much more work. And I'm thrilled that uh, you're partnering on this with the Women's Foundation to bring these key policy points that are critical to women into the public discussion, issues critical to our income, and as you mentioned just now, wealth, the wealth issue, because frequently women have minimal retirements available to them, uh, and to make sure that we support women as they support uh, themselves and their families. And I know one of your policy documents uh, being discussed today is entitled Addressing Pay Inequality and Boosting Income for Women. And I'm especially uh, compelled by this uh, particular topic because, as you mentioned, uh, the battle for equal pay uh, has been a long-standing battle. Back when I started this uh, fight uh, myself about 35, 40 years ago, women were making about 57 cents to every dollar a man was making. Of course, that was white women. And today we've improved. We're at 78 cents as white women for every dollar earned by a white man. But as your policy paper points out, this disparity is even worse for women of color. In fact, in 2016, Latinas earned 42 cents for every dollar earned by non-white Latino men, 
which represents, by the way, the worst wage gap in the country. And in contrary to what some people believe, this isn't the gap that can be explained away simply by oh, women's life choices. In fact, it's a gap that exists regardless of the industry a woman is in. Everything from nursing uh, to manufacturing, we see a huge uh, disparity that cannot be explained uh, by life choices. And it's a gap that frankly exists regardless of a woman's educational level. We know women with master's degrees are paid less than men who have the same degree, and in fact, women with doctoral degrees often have uh, been shown to be paid less than men with simply master's degrees. So. It isn't a problem, though, that just impacts women. It hurts families, and it hurts our economy. And when I did my equal pay bill, I focused on the fact that it does impact our economy and our families because uh, it's estimated just here in California because of the wage gap, women leave $39 billion a year on the table, again, in California alone. So that's money that isn't going into our businesses, it doesn't go into our communities, or into our tax base. And... Um, uh, we need to address that problem as we in the legislature are continuing to work to ensure that gender pay back, uh, excuse me, the gender pay gap won't be a reality looming over more generations of women. So the Fair Pay Act, which I'm so honored to have authored and passed into law in 2015 with the help of probably many of you on the line today, uh, it's one of the strongest equal pay bills in the country and is in fact a template that's being used by, I think it's 41 other states to make real equal pay the law of this land. But it isn't enough just to pass the law. We have to be able to ensure that companies are indeed complying with it, as you point out in your addressing pay inequality brief. And your brief calls for legislation to require large businesses to annually report to the state pay and job uh, a title uh, um, to report to the state, I should say, what the job and pay data information is by gender and race and ethnicity. And I'm so pleased that we're on the same page here because this year I have a bill, uh, SB 1284, that I've offered uh, that uh, requires California employers with 100 or more employees uh, to submit a pay data um, uh, report annually to the Department of Industrial Relations and the Department of Fair Employment and Housing, which outline the compensation and hours worked of their employees and to do it by gender, race, ethnicity, and job category. And again, uh, why data? Uh, same reason that we're here today. We know that this will allow uh, the public, particularly in this case the state, to more accurately and efficiently identify patterns of wage disparities and allow for targeted enforcement of our equal pay laws when appropriate. So in addition, and I think equally as importantly, it, it is designed to encourage employers to analyze their own pay practices to ensure that they're fair and that they're complying with the law and allow them to self-correct. Because a lot of this discrimination, I believe, is based on implicit, not intended bias. But we know it isn't enough to support women with equal pay. We need to make sure that women are able to find and afford reliable quality and safe childcare for their families. And your data shows more and more women are in the workforce today. Indeed, in California, 66% of mothers are in the workforce. So what do we do with our children? I mean, it means more families than ever are being asked to balance work and family life, life and seek child care. So um, in your brief on supporting working uh, mothers in California, you point out the lack of access to quality child care is a significant barrier to the economic well-being of many struggling working families. So providing these families with a hand up will increase their chances for upward mobility while providing the important quality care for their children. And for more than two decades, uh, the Legislative Women's Caucus here in California has championed child care funding as its top caucus priority. Recently, I'm pleased to say the caucus has been able to secure more than a billion dollars in funding for early care and education. And this year, the caucus is calling for an additional billion for babies. Now, I don't know whether we're going to get it, but it is a discussion and a subject that is critically important that we address now and going forward. We know that family leave is also critical to these families and that the research makes clear that the first months and years of a baby's life are critical to that child's success. 
with more than 80% of a child's total brain development happening in the thir first three years of life, and frequent nurturing parent-child interactions is key to strong brain development uh, in those first three months of life also being a critical component. So last year I was successful in uh, authoring legislation, SB 63, that provides up to 12 weeks of job-protected maternity and paternity leave for Californians who work for a company with 20 or more employees. These measures are gonna benefit up to an additional 2.7 million Californians over and above the law which currently allows for this job protected leave for employees who work for larger companies of 50 or more. We know that working families have to have the ability and the opportunity to spend the first key months of each child's life establishing a foundation for success. You know, family leave is not a luxury. It provides major biological and developmental benefits for a child, and no one should have to choose between the well-being of their new child and their family's financial security. Your work confirms that, and so I want to thank you, uh, both the Budget and Policy Center and Women's Foundation, for your excellent work and for hosting this forum. I am really proud of the work that we've accomplished, again, with many of you on this webinar so far, and look forward to continuing to work together to ensure that California is a beacon and that it is a place that reflects the strength of our women and that recognizes and values our contributions to the economy and to society and the importance of work-life balance and equity in all we do. And with that, I thank you for the opportunity to be participating with you today. Thank you, Senator Jackson, so much for joining us and especially for your leadership at the Capitol on behalf of women and girls and all that you've done to advance gender justice. We're all very grateful to you. And we're also grateful that you are going to, um, amidst all your travel today, going to try to rejoin us um, a little bit later after Kristen um, speaks, which will be in a moment. So thank you again. Um, and before I turn it over to Kristen, um, I just want to remind everybody that um, you can be thinking about your questions and on your control panel um, on the GoToWebinar toolbar kit, you can be um, typing them in so that we can get to your questions. And then also a reminder about our hashtags for today, hashtag policy perspectives and hashtag Cal CA Women Thrive, California Women Thrive. Um, and so now I'm gonna turn it over to Christian Schumacher, who's with the, the researcher behind all of this data and all of the analysis that we're gonna hear about uh, with the California Budget and Policy Center. Kristen's gonna take us through some of the top lines for um, the briefs, advancing gender and racial equity, work support, building wealth and the safety nets. Kristen, over to you. Thanks, Serena, and thanks to everyone that's on the webinar today. We're really thrilled that you're here to join us. So as mentioned, my name is Kristen Schumacher. I'm a senior policy analyst at the Budget Center, and I'm the lead analyst working on the California Women's Wellbeing Index. In my remarks today, I'm going to provide a brief overview of the California Women's Wellbeing Index for those of you that may not be familiar with this online interactive tool. In addition, I'm going to take you through some of the new functional elements of the index. And then finally, I'm going to provide a brief summary of four new issue briefs related, as you've heard, to women's economic security, employment, and earnings. Next slide, please. So the California Women's Wellbeing Index is a multi-dimensional measure of how women are faring in counties across California. So as this diagram illustrates, there are 30 indicators, those, that's that long list on your right-hand side, and they're grouped under five topical dimensions that Chris mentioned earlier, health, personal safety, employment and earnings, <clears throat> economic security, and political empowerment. In addition to our county level data, the index also includes data by race and ethnicity at the state level for 22 of the 30 indicators. So next slide, please. So when you, this slide shows an image of the index landing page. And on our heat map here, blue represents a higher score. And by higher, we mean um, more positive. It represents a higher score relative to other counties. And then the darker the red, the lower the score relative to other counties. And as you can see, counties with the greatest overall well-being 
are in and around the Bay Area and in Lake Tahoe as well. And the counties with lower relative scores are in the San Joaquin Valley and the Sacramento Valley, which is north of Sacramento region. And then in some of those northern counties too. So when you click on the county map on the landing page or on the stackable list of county names, you can pop up a county fact sheet. Next page, please. Next slide, please. So this slide just shows you a sample of one of our county fact sheets. And this county fact sheet provides data for all 30 indicators at the county level. And this is just showing the top half of the LA County, just as an example. Next slide, please. And then due to the support of J.P. Morgan Chase, we were able to improve the utility of the index and we produced indicator fact sheets that provide data for all 58 counties and also data by race and ethnicity for the state too. For example, this slide shows just a screenshot of our poverty indicator fact sheet for L poverty indicator fact sheet. And the front of the page is going to provide the data by race and ethnicity whenever available. And then the back side, which isn't here, shows a table or provides a table of the county level data for all 58 counties. Next slide, please. In addition to the indicator fact sheets, we've also made the index more user friendly by making it smartphone compatible. So if anyone has their smartphone available, you can pop open the index and um, check it out while I'm talking. We also made the data available in an Excel file for those of you that really love data like we do. And that bright red arrow up at the top of the screen is pointing to the get data button. That's gonna prompt you to download the file in Excel. And then finally, as has been discussed, we produced a set of four issue briefs related specifically to the economic security, employment earnings dimensions. These issue briefs provide a deeper dive on the data analysis, some different cuts of the data, and they also provide some policy recommendations for both state and local level policymakers. And you can get those briefs with the policy recommendations button, again, there at the top. Next slide, please. So as you've heard, we structured these briefs around four things. And they include strengthening public systems and supports, supporting working mothers, addressing pay inequality and boosting income, and then helping women build wealth. So in the remainder of my presentation, I'm going to review some of the data and analysis and then also some of those policy recommend recommendations from each of those briefs. But in the interest of time, I'm just going to offer a few highlights. And so I really encourage you when you have the time to download the complete set and take a look. So to begin, I'm going to start with the analysis and policy recommendations from the strengthening public systems and supports brief. Next slide, please. So this chart shows the percentage of women and men living below the official federal poverty line in California. Here you can see that women are more likely than men to live in poverty at every stage of life. And this is especially true for women at a time when they're often expanding their families and again, later in life. As you can see, the gap between women and men is especially pronounced for the 25 to 34 age group, and again, for the 75 plus age group. The persistence of race-based discrimination means that some women face greater challenges. And our data analysis from this issue brief shows that a larger share of African-American, Latinx, and Native American women cannot afford enough food. They struggle to pay for housing, and they, a greater share of these women live in poverty, as compared specifically to Asian and white women. So, however, I would also note that across the board, the levels of food insecurity, housing cost burden, and poverty levels are unacceptable for any woman, regardless of their um, demographics. And because of women's high poverty rates, women are more likely than men to rely on public systems and supports to afford the basics. And when I talk about public systems and supports, I'm talking about things like food assistance, or perhaps public health care coverage, or subsidized early care and education just to name a few. Next slide. So there are a number of actions both state and local policymakers can take to strengthen public systems and supports. <clears throat> to begin, policymakers can take action to integrate and simplify the process to apply for these different programs, which can be really confusing and really a complex pro process. Local leaders can also increase multilingual and multicultural outreach to eligible, eligible populations we know that in California, people speak 220 different languages. And we just wanna make sure that women and their families can access programs and services without fear and also regardless of the language they're speaking at home. 
So state policymakers can also restore funding to programs that were cut during and after the Great Recession. And so this increased programs like CalWORKs, which is our Welfare to Work program, and our SSI SSP program. These programs provide cash assistance to parents with kids in the case of CalWORKs, and then cash assistance to seniors and individuals living with disabilities in the case of SSI SSP. So grant levels for these programs were cut during and after the Great Recession, and they haven't been fully restored. And they currently leave individuals and families living below the official poverty line. So finally, policymakers can work to increase access to safe and affordable housing. And we all know that in California, there, there's an affordable housing crisis. And any kind of policy approach to the affordable housing crisis, it will have to be multifaceted. It will have to be over a course of many years. But in, these, in this issue brief, we just set forth a couple of policy recommendations that may make a sense. So for example, we believe that policymakers at the state level can work to increase the supply of affordable housing units. And in addition, local leaders and state leaders for that matter, can boost some tenant protections to make sure that renters aren't unfairly evicted from their homes. And so at this point, I'm gonna to transition to our second brief, supporting working mothers. So as Senator Jackson noted, the share of women balancing work and family life has shifted dramatically in the past 50 years, especially as more white women enter the workforce. Women of color have a much longer history of working while raising their children. So this chart shows the percentage of mothers who are breadwinners in California from 1960, 1967 to 2016. And overall, the share of breadwinning mothers has more than doubled during this period. And this means that women's paid work has become incredibly important to families' economic security. So it's critical that women are paid a living wage, but this is especially true for mothers that are the sole breadwinner for their family. Next chart, please. Yet we know that a large number of women earn low wages in California. As you can see, across race and ethnicity categories, a larger share of women than men earn low, low wages. However, a much larger share of Native American, African American, and Latinx women are earning low wages. And again, this is due in part to a legacy of discriminatory policies and structural racism, which really creates barriers to success. So this is a couple of um, ramifications. Women who, who earn low wages may have a harder time supporting their families. For example, a mother earning low wages is going to um, have a hard time affording the cost of childcare. In California, the typical single mom earns just $30,000 a year, and, it, and, and that was for 2016. And she would have to spend about 70% of her income on the cost of care for two kids in a licensed center. Obviously, that doesn't leave a lot of room left over for other expenses like the high cost of housing or healthcare, for example. In addition, women earning low wages also typically work in jobs with limited benefits, and they're also subject to unfair scheduling practices, which means that they don't often know in advance what their schedule will be or how many hours they're gonna get. And this makes it really difficult to balance work and family responsibilities. It's hard to schedule your childcare provider if you don't know what hours you're gonna work, and it's hard to balance your family budget if you don't know what your paycheck's gonna be week to week. Next slide, please. Given the large number of families balancing work and family obligations, it's really important that the state and local policymakers take action to support working mothers in California. So they can do that in a number of ways. As you've heard, California is a leader when it comes to paid family leave. However, when you look at California or the United States even, as compared to other developed nations, we are completely behind. So California should continue to expand our paid leave program, and we should expand it to six months. And we should also boost the wage replacement levels, particularly for low-income caregivers. This is gonna increase the chances that they can afford to take time off to care for their family. If you're a woman earning poverty level wages, it's gonna be really difficult to take your paid leave that you have earned if you're only gonna earn 70% of that wage back during your leave. Another action policymakers can take is extending the Cali EITC to family members who aren't working for pay but are caring for dependents. The Cal EITC is a refundable tax credit that can create real positive change for people that are struggling to get by. And by extending this to unpaid caregivers, we really will recognize in our state that we value caregiving. Policymakers should also 
boost funding for the state's subsidized childcare and development system. Much like CalWORKs and SSI and SSP, policymakers cut this system dramatically, draining after the Great Recession. And we're, far, excuse me, we're serving far fewer families. And this is with unprecedented need. We've calculated just one out of seven eligible children are actually accessing subsidized care. State or local policymakers can also pass fair work week legislation. And that would require employers to give workers a more routine schedule with stable hours. And this is gonna help families line up childcare and it's also gonna result in more predictable paychecks too. So at this point, I'm going to transition to our third issue brief, focusing on pay inequality. So you've already heard some of these data points. And so this is um, the charts that Senator Jackson was referencing. And it shows the wage gap between white men and then women dis disaggregated by race and ethnicity. As you can see, white women working full-time year-round earn just 70 cents, 78 cents compared to white men's dollar. However, this disparity is much greater for women of color and especially for Latinx women who earn just 42 cents as compared to white men's dollar. So the wage gap is due to multiple factor, factors such as occupational choices or time spent in the labor force. But the gap is also due just to gender and race-based discrimination. In addition, research shows that when women leave jobs due to harassment in the workplace, their pay often takes a hit, which can have lifelong consequences. Mm -hmm. Also, low-wage workers subject to harassment often can't speak out for fear of losing hours or even losing their jobs. It simply isn't affordable for them. Next slide, please. So state policymakers can work to address these issues in a number of ways as well. They can start by requiring large businesses to annually report to the state pay and job title data, much like Senator Jackson mentioned. State policymakers can also take steps to strengthen workplace protections against harassment. As just one example, policymakers can extend the statute of limitations to file a claim from one year to three. Oftentimes, individuals may not know their rights or may not know that what they're ex experiencing is illegal. Finally, to further boost the income of women truly struggling to afford the basics, policymakers can continue to expand upon the Cal EITC in a number of ways. And just one example is increasing the income eligibility limits in the next few years to keep pace with the rising minimum wage, which is slated to move up to $15 an hour by 2022. So finally, I'm going to transition to our last issue, which focuses on helping women build wealth. So wealth is a measure of what an individual owns minus their debt, and it's often a better indica indicator of financial security than income. So similar to the wage gap, there are huge disparities in wealth between women of color and white men and women. In the US, both Latinx and African American women have very little wealth. The issue brief also shows that in California, women of color lag behind in both home ownership and business ownership, which are two critical ways in which individuals build wealth in California and in the US. In addition, certain practices strip wealth from families and these practices tend to hit communities of color particularly hard. So one example includes um, fines and fees for individuals that are involved with the criminal justice system. These fines and fees tend to place a heavy burden on women in particular because they often cover the cost for family members. Also certain predatory lending practices such as payday lending also tend to prey on communities of color and st strip wealth from many. Next slide, please. So there are a number of actions policymakers can take here too. For example, cities and counties can help families build wealth by investing in a pathway to home ownership. And this would allow families to build wealth and, ac and access an affordable home too. And one such example, is um, a shared equity home ownership model. Also, policymakers should fund outreach to promote a new voluntary retirement savings plan in California. This plan is called Cal Savers, and it's going to launch next year. Research shows that the program has real potential to improve retirement secu security for low-income Californians. However, right now, the state can't fund outreach for this program without a technical change in statute. So policymakers can also follow the lead of a handful of other states and eliminate asset limits in CalWORKs, which again is our welfare to work program. This would allow families to accumulate modest savings without actually losing eligibility to the program. 
Research in other states shows that this doesn't dramatically increase state costs. It actually reduces the cost due to less administrative burden and verifying eligibility, but you don't see a, a large increase in caseload. At the local level, policymakers can take action to reform city, count, city and county fines and fees. So San Francisco recently released a great report and a guide for local leaders. And they're currently leading this effort, not just in California, but in the nation. And that's um, a resource for those that are interested in moving down that path. And then finally, state policymakers can curb predatory lending practices by imposing limitations on certain financial products like payday loans and high cost installment loans. And when I talk about imposing limitations, I'm talking about an annual interest rate cap to make sure that families don't get caught in a debt trap that they can't find their way out of. Because this also will strip their wealth and prohibit them from building wealth in the future as well. So as we've heard, we know that when women thrive, their families and communities prosper. And we're all better off when everyone, regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, or any other democratic demographic category, is better off and has the opportunity to excel. So at that point, I'm gonna take it over to Serena. Back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Kristen. And um, as you can all see, there's an amazing amount of data there and analysis, which um, I think will help us all in our work. I know that um, Senator Jackson was going to try to join, rejoin us um, to respond briefly to Kristen, so I just want to see if you're on the line. I am. I'd be delighted. Great. Thank you so much. So, um, as you can see, I am on the plan, I apologize, but um, I think the best response is that each one of these uh, suggested policy measures are things that either we are uh, working on or have achieved here in California or have discovered that there are some real challenges and obstacles uh, to trying to achieve greater parity in the workplace, uh, greater job. So um, like balance, uh, and, and one of the biggest obstacles uh, is the, uh, is the, the power structure, if you will, that is set up by the chambers of commerce, uh, by the manufacturers' association, by those who represent the big companies who don't um, believe or um, uh, want to encourage the kinds of flexibility that we need as a 21st century world. And this has been a challenge for us. Uh, of course, we're seeing it on a national level too, this notion that uh, people are poor by uh, intent, that they are just not willing to work hard. And it's really had a bit of a, uh, a, a had a layer of kind of negativity um, that we are seeing or have been seeing that, to go along with, to compound the fact that Frankly, the State Chamber of Commerce, if they don't like some of these ideas, the idea of flexible work hours, for example, is one of the things that you mentioned, um, paid leave to six months. Uh, I had indicated I worked hard and was able to get 12 weeks. But boy, I'll tell you, that was a battle. You have companies saying, oh, these are job killers. The Chamber doesn't like um, any of this flexibility. Everything's a job killer. It's going to destroy businesses here in California. It's sort of their mantra. And I think what we need to do is certainly getting more women elected who have had to balance work and life and who've had to care for aging parents or grandchildren and see that the fabric of our society today is very different than it was 50 or 100 years ago. Um, we really need to keep pushing that envelope. And of course, having the data that you are presenting is very, very, very helpful. Um, you mentioned the Voluntary Retirement Savings Program. This is really could be a game changer, but we're seeing impediments to this coming from uh, the federal side. And we have to really be honest that those in power, those with the money, don't want to share it. Uh, the battle we had to increase the minimum wage, which we have done, um, and other states are following, is an enormous battle. Uh, so we really have to work very hard, help change the culture, help change help change the messaging because when when we have to uh, call on all of these social programs because we have people living in poverty, we have people living on the streets, the level of homelessness, the level of mental illness, the level of problems that society then has to absorb. Uh, we really are missing great opportunities, both in terms of the fiscal health of the state and of the country, but also the uh, spiritual, moral, and human values. 
uh, that people bring uh, to the table and bring to the their community. So, um, rather than get into specific detail on all of them, I think we also have to talk about this conceptually as well and keep working towards every one of those issues that in policy proposals are valuable. Most, if not all of them, we started to address and try to bring forward in the form of legislation. And I just want to leave you all with the notion that uh, if we continue working together, banging these drums, uh, showing the data, showing how the state will benefit economically uh, as well as in our quality of life by doing these uh, things to eradicate poverty, to create greater equity and equality of opportunity. That's what will make California um, the leader uh, and will bring the country along with it in a way that will benefit everybody. Thank you so much, Senator Jackson, for joining us. Um, and especially while you're in the midst of traveling, uh, it sounds like well, you're getting ready to. Standing in the aisle, we are only down to middle seat. We are, but I thank you for your great work, and I thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak today, and look forward to working with you in the future. Look to your left, look to your right. Wonderful, and us as well. Thank you so much. Uh, so we're going to continue to move on today, and uh, before we move to our next speaker, I just want to remind everybody to um, get your questions into the control panel. Uh, we'll have time for questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, some of them are already starting to come in, and so we're looking forward to others of you. Also a reminder to uh, uh, tweet your um, responses to this webinar through the hashtags hashtag policy perspectives and hashtag California women thrive, that's CA women thrive. Um, and then next I'm going to invite Noreen Farrell, uh, who is the executive director of Equal Rights Advocates and the chair of the Stronger California Coalition to uh, join us on the webinar. Hi, thanks everybody. Um, great to be here and I'm really so excited to see the policy recommendations of um, of the index and um, know that it really tracks very closely work that we're doing in partnership with, you can, you can change the slide, you know, 50, 30 plus core organizations, um, but up to 50 who are also supporters across the country, across the state, coalitions and individual organizations that are really serving millions of Californians have come together for our Stronger California campaign. And we were founded a couple of years ago to really do and track what is, is clear is happening in this well-being index. And that's really have a comprehensive agenda that looks at all contributors to economic security for women and their families in California. Um, and we've been working very closely with Senator Jackson and other women uh, legislators in the California Legislative Women's Caucus to advance our agenda. And I thought I would just spend a couple of minutes um, walking you through this year's agenda and particularly where it overlaps with some of the recommendations that, um, that you've heard about today. Um, and so if you just could go to the next slide, we'll get started. Um, this is a very big agenda. Um, there are over 16 pieces of legislation and pretty comprehensive budget asks. And again, um, they're, they're formed by statewide coalitions working across four pillars of what our agenda is. Um, which track very closely the well-being index, um, expanding access to childcare, um, addressing poverty, building wealth, um, making sure we're supporting family-friendly workplaces, and then also um, making sure that we're we're pushing fair pay, fair job opportunities, workplace justice, particularly for um, low-wage workers, immigrant women workers, and those who are most vulnerable to exploitation. And so, um, going to the next slide. Um, you can see a couple of um, bills that um, track the recommendations very closely. Um, so this is our child care, um, our child care uh, pillar. And what's exciting is um, AB 2023 would make the state child independent care expenses refundable, um, which has been a recommendation out of the Wellbeing Index. Um, another, um, the billion for ba babies, Senator Jackson mentioned. Um, very exciting. We realize that we need to go bold to really meet the needs of families across California. So if I could have the next slide, I'll explain some more great bills. 
So um, SB 10, which was a recommendation, um, and I'm glad to see it's consistent with um, one of our agenda priorities. The California Bail Money Reform Act um, really is just to make the bail system in this in the state much more fair. We know it has a really profound disproportionate impact on women of color who are po posting bail for loved ones. Um, and there's a there's a couple of ways that it significantly reduces the use of money bail. So it's an exciting bill um, that we're we're tracking and it's moving along very well through the state legislature. And just for folks who are wondering about the legislative process, we're about um, halfway through the legislative cycle in Sacramento, and um, we've just gotten through the first house, um, and now all the bills will be going through the second house. And I can report on how we're doing at the end. Um, the, the next is um, a $1.5 billion ask to really end deep childhood poverty. And we're really passionate about this issue. Um, and um, it's, you know, it really, it, it really is, it's really important because it's placing a minimum grant level um, to ensure that no CalWork families fall below, below the 50% federal poverty line. Um, I'm happy to say that it just passed through the Senate um, with a unanimous 39 to zero vote. So we're well on the way to getting that passed. Of course, there's a budget piece of it that we're still negotiating. Um, the um, AB 13, uh, 3200 also tracks a, um, a recommendation of, um, of the Wellbeing Index, and that um, would require SSP um, payments to be increased so that all SSI and SSP grants are at least 100% of the federal poverty line. Um, and it also reinstates cost of living adjustments um, for those payments. Um, next, next slide, please. Um, so our, our family friendly workplaces, um, I was, I loved all the recommendation of, um, of the wellbeing index in terms of family friendly workplaces. A lot of those are, have and are in the works. Um, I just want to highlight one that is also, we think is really important. Um, SB 937 would be the most comprehensive lactation accommodations, um, law in the nation. And we know we really want, want to make sure that mothers stay in the workplace. Um, and that is very difficult if they aren't able to um, have lactation accommodations. And so this bill um, would not only um, set really important standards, it also require lactation spaces to be, um, to be added to new buildings and renovated build buildings in California. Next slide. Can you push the next to the next slide? While that's being while that's being set up, um, a couple of these uh, Senator Jackson talked about. Um, really excited to see um, the re recommendation of the index to be consistent with um, one of our policy priorities, um, which is to ensure that we have pay data reporting. And what's important is that it's pay data reporting by sex, race, and the ethnicity. As you've heard from prior speakers, um, it is really important to take that intersectional approach. Um, to big paid data tracking. Um, some of these others um, are the stopping the forced waivers of workers' rights, that's AB 3080. That is another recommendation that you've heard today. Um, and essentially that would um, prohibit um, employers from forcing employees to sign arbitration clauses as a condition of employment. So next slide, please. And anybody who has questions about all the other bills on, um, on this agenda, please contact me offline. I only have a couple of minutes. So um, I was really, um, really very thrilled to see sexual harassment addressed in the index. I think it's been left off of a conversation about um, economic well-being for women um, until obviously the Me Too movement um, has come forward. And I'm happy to report that many of the recommendations from um, the index are included in our agenda. Um, I note that um, AB 1870 will extend the statute of limitations for claims because what we find, we find is people don't actually know what their rights are and their one year statute of limitations expires before they have a chance to really vindicate their rights. And so this would extend the statute of limitations from one year to three years, which is really uh, important. I also just want to note SB 1038. What we find, especially representing low wage workers, farm workers, janitors, restaurant workers, is that the fear of retaliation if they complain is so intense that they often just leave their jobs rather than make a complaint, um, which of course um, you know, impacts their economic security in so many ways and that of their family. 
So this would um, clarify that the law will hold individuals who engage in retaliation for people who complain, not just sexual harassment, but of a whole other kinds of uh, harassment and discrimination based on all sorts of protected classes, um, that that person could be individually liable, which we hope will be a good, strong deter deterrent um, that hasn't necessarily existed before in the California law. Um, so those are the highlights um, from the Stronger California agenda. Um, we're really excited that the index provides critical data for us to uh, not only show the statewide issues, but also to bring individual legislators data from their regions that is very compelling as we try to make the case for this. So um, my deep gratitude for all the work that went into the data. It has been a game changer for this agenda um, and I'm sure it will continue to be so as we move forward. Thanks, Serena. Great, thank you, Noreen, and our deep gratitude right back at you for all the advocacy work that you're doing to advance gender justice in California. Uh, next, we're gonna turn to Danielle Beavers with the Greenlining Institute. And Danielle is also a fellow in our economic justice team for the Women's Foundation of California's Women's Policy Institute this year. So Danielle, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Serena. And thank you so much for the index for putting this together and all of you that are attending. I'm always very excited to rep uh, Women's Policy Institute and the index. So it's a pleasure to be here. Um, a little bit about myself. You know, like most of us on the call, um, my interest in this space and advocacy definitely comes from a personal experience. Um, I've spent my entire career in racial justice, but of course we don't just have one identity, right? Um, and as a rape survivor, gender justice has been something that's always been very important to me. Um, and it was a couple of years ago now, um, folks might remember that there was an ex-swimmer from Stanford named um, Brock Turner who sexually assaulted someone and um, that person was unknown and came forward as Emily Doe in 2016 and published this amazing letter to him. Um, and that definitely galvanized a lot of conversations, right? Um, and after speaking about my own experience, and this is just a brief clip from a, um, an article that I was interviewed for, after speaking out about my own experience and it's particularly the intersection between race and gender, I definitely wanted to sharpen my skills and expand my toolbox to be in a just justice oriented space around gender. Um, so I applied for the Women's Policy Institute and I'm currently a fellow on the economic justice team, which has been amazing. Um, next slide, please. Um, and uh, before coming to WPI, um, all of my work is really focused on combating redlining communities of color. Um, and this is a, a map that shows how this practice was literally done, drawing red lines around communities of color, but it can also happen figuratively, right? Um, and redlining is essentially a verb to exclude people from opportunities based on race. And that's actually where the word greenlining, the organization that I work for, um, gets its name from. Uh, next slide. So we uh, strategically focus on the industries that are driving our economy um, and making sure that American or that um, the American dream is accessible to communities of color as well. Um, and so we're in what I like to call non-traditional civil rights issues, right? Like these are definitely um, areas that impact folks of color, but don't often get a lot of attention, right? And so we specifically focus on these areas. And then at the top, you'll see diversity and inclusion. That's the team that I direct. That holds all of our jobs advocacy via workforce and supplier diversity policies. Um, next slide, please. And so this brings me to the first reason that I'd really like to uplift the index. Um, when I started with the Women's Policy Institute Fellowship, I'll, I was a little nervous. And I'm nervous saying that in front of Serena here, but I have to admit I was a little nervous, right? I, I didn't know how my experience as a person of color would be received in such a gender oriented space, but it was actually during our first retreat that we were introduced to the index as a resource when we were researching what our bills would potentially cover. Um, and when we started going through it, this is just a screenshot um, and Kristen had a lot of great screenshots in her uh, portion of the presentation. Um, but when we were going through this and seeing how the different qualities of life were being unpacked and then also how they had wonderful data on race i knew that the women's policy institute was the right place for me and that the index was definitely a tool that i would be using not just in wpi but far beyond um, and so 
what I really loved in this challenge to me in my own advocacy was to incorporate more intersectionality, right? Which is something that we've already touched on a little bit, but essentially the idea, you can go to the next slide, great, thank you. Um, and you can see it defined at the bottom is, at least how Greenlining um, identify or defines it, is that intersectionality is when identities overlap and can create um, overlapping or interdependent um, systems of sources and oppression. And so this is an excerpt from our new diversity, equity, and inclusion framework. And this portion right here really challenges folks to be explicit and precise in who they're talking about for their DEI advocacy. And from the index and the WPI, I um, wanted to make sure that I brought in that intersectionality. And so that's something that Greenlining now practices in a lot of our work. The second slide, please, or next slide. This brings me to the second reason why I really love uplifting the index. Um, this is a simplified version of my program's theory of change, right? So going from research to thought leadership, movement building, and then the actual advocacy piece, right? Um, I'm on a team of two and a half full-time employees, and so doing all of this across an entire organization is very, very challenging, right? Like we wear a lot of hats, like most of you on this webinar here. And so the index provides such great data and it's disaggregated on so many different levels not just including race but also geography and issue area that this really helps lift the burden of of, of fulfilling that research research portion in how greenlining conducts our diversity and inclusion advocacy um, and then just one more slide please and then I also just want to do one more plug really quickly for the Women's Policy Institute. We were in a workshop around communication and um, to the figure on the left is an image that I borrowed from a workshop that we had on how you essentially engage folks, right? So going from educating people about an issue at the broadest standpoint, right? Like first they have to know about the issue and then that gets funneled all the way down into policy. And as soon as I saw this, it resonated so much with me and kind of our theory of change here. And I even color coded um, the different areas of how they interrelate to each other. But this really kind of like hit home for me of how fundamental and foundational research is to any form of advocacy and making sure that you go from educating people about issues and then turning that into actual knowledge. And so I'll end it there. Um, just want to thank everyone so much for your time, and especially for the index and the Women's Policy Institute. Um, really encourage you to check the tool out and in, incorporate it into your own advocacy as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danielle. Uh, as you can see from Danielle's remarks, um, the index is just really a useful tool and something that we can really put into practice in terms of the research and the data. Uh, so I want to remind everybody to um, put your questions into the control panel section uh, that says questions and um, also our hashtags policy perspectives and hashtag CA women thrive California women thrive uh, our last speaker today is Kelly Todd Griffin who is with the select Inc and the state of black women in California initiative uh, so Kelly I'm going to turn it over to you and then we'll have a moderated discussion and take questions from the audience thanks so much great thank you thank you um, First, I want to thank the um, the Budget and Policy Center and the Women Foundation for giving us this time to really give some insight to the state of Black women in California, which we kind of talk about as being the invisible minority. Um, one of the good things about going last is that I can piggyback on what everybody else said, and I seem so much more informed. Um, next slide, um, please. So just a little bit about Sisterlect. Sisterlect is the organization um, that I founded focused on empowering uh, women of color, particularly black women in a meaningful way. And one of our signature initiatives is the state of black women in California, um, which provides a strategic policy platform and action plan. The Women's Wellbeing Index um, really helped guide our work. And so I think what I'm going to talk about and the next slide is really how the index was put into practice. Next slide. So understanding the data. Um, next slide. Next slide. The, 
so um, sorry, the slide before, sorry about that. So we um, created the um, State of Black Women in California in partnership with Sierra Health Foundation and about 60 Black women leaders throughout the state to take a look at equity among Black women and girls in California. Some of them are actually um, here on the webinar, like Black Women for Wellness. Um, we had them attending Genesis out in Los Angeles, and then we had Sacramento Sister Circle. Um, we had a lot of different organizations, BWAPA, um, which is Black Women Organized for Political Action, um, that participated with us along with some of our key Black women leaders. We had Senator Holly Mitchell um, kick off the uh, activities that we did when we did our convening here in Sacramento. Um, and so one of the things we really wanted to do is to do for the first time is really look at kind of a collective conscious effort around who we are and what is the state of our quality of life indexes. Although women of color are progressing as a whole, Black women are more likely um, to, be seen, to be single breadwinners, live in poverty, and face significant barriers. So the Black Women's Wellbeing Index really kind of tells a bleak story when you're looking at the data as it relates to Black women. Next slide. Black women in the state, we're 1.1 million um, women and girls live in California. Um, we're the third largest population actually in the nation, only behind Georgia and New York. Next slide. And so when you look at the data, it kind of creates a narrative that gives us, you know, pause, but it also requires action. So we look at 74% of black households are headed by single black mothers the highest among all women. And that's important because when you start overlaying the other data, that intersectionality of all of it, it's a huge impact. For instance, the 59 cent um, to every dollar that a white male makes. When almost three quarters of the black households are headed by single black women, the impact of that is significant as it relates to the housing bur burden, childcare burden, because there really isn't any other source of income. When we look at the wealth gap, which is $300, which is the lowest among all women, and you start looking at bail reform, and you only have 26% of black women, um, single women owning homes, if um, they need to, achieve to um, get bail because of a situation, whether with a loved one, a son, or even themselves, there's no wealth attached to that because there's no home that they can put up as collateral. Um, so the impact is significant. And then when you look at the housing burden, housing cost burden for black women, which is the highest among all women, it's at 50.6%. And then um, one of the things that um, we noticed in the newest data, um, is that Black women are now the highest um, group of women that live in poverty um, at 21.4%. Last year, we were actually second from the last. Um, when we see the 59 cent last year, we were at 63 cent. Um, so the new data is showing we're not improving, we're actually decreasing when we see other groups in the um, of women actually improving their quality of life. Next slide. So what does that do? That created a, an agenda for us um, that we wanted to make sure that we started to talk about. And that agenda, um, for instance, is why we're actually here today and providing the information. You know, we want to elevate the narrative. Black women and girls are struggling in California. Many times when people are talking about women of color, we get lumped into the group women of color. And so not looking directly at the data as it impacts black women tend to be, um, it tends to hurt us more than any other women of color group. And we see that in the data, particularly in the new data sheets that were released today. Um, we need to expand our current policy and funding priorities. When we look at some of the bills like um, the Holly Mitchell bill around CalWORKs, which is um, which Noreen talked about, SB 982, um, that's significant for Black women, particularly as more Black women are living in poverty than any other group. When we look at SB 10 around bail reform, um, it's important for us as well. So we, we want to look at what are some of the bills that help uh, address some of the issues 
that Black women face, but also in the funding priorities. We find that most of the funding tends to go downstream, and a lot of times it impacts Black men and Black men and boys, particularly when you start looking at My Brother's Keeper, um, when you start looking at the men and boys of color initiatives, and so we're not seeing a comparative initiatives around the funding or policy um, that supports the needs of Black women and girls throughout the state. Um, we also want to look at developing interventions to improve the disparity gaps, but understanding the data and the intersectional information that comes with the data, again, single Black women lead households. And so if we have 74% leading the households, 80% being primary breadwinners of the household, meaning they make more than 40% of the the income coming into the household, then we know that interventions need to look a little different. Um, and when we say little different, it's like, how are we talking about childcare? When we talk about the Family Leave Act, although um, it's a priority for many of us to ensure and strengthen for Black women being able to take off six weeks or even when you're ML, um, when you're looking at the Family Leave Act that provides no um, support for um, the additional income, it impacts us more. So we're, more, we're less likely to take off the necessary time that we need to be able to take care of our family and the family issues if we have no income to supplement the gap that we're missing when we need to take off time. And therefore, that also impacts our overall health, our overall wellness, how we participate with our children in terms of health care when we need to take time off. We don't have the opportunities like other communities to have other people take um, our children to the doctor. And so we tend to work longer, stay longer, so that when we do have an emergency in health um, care related to our children, we're not using it up for ourselves, which of course, uh, Black women have the highest percentage of chronic diseases among all um, other groups. The other part of how it relates to health is that Black women actually are insured at 80%. Um, the issue with Black women is the co-payments um, and the deductibles. And those are the things, and those are the women that are not on Medi-Cal. Those are the things that matter and impact wealth. Because again, we're more likely not to have extra funds because we are um, head of household. So seeing, um, strengthening current programs and services, as well as filling the gaps, one of the things that we do is we partner a lot with a lot of organizations throughout the state to look at what are the current programs and how can we overlay some of the recommendations that were issued with the state of Black women in California to be able to strengthen those programs. But we also recognize that there are a lot of gaps in the current programs, particularly around wealth building, and so we're trying to get more involved in building wealth. And one of the things we really appreciate um, the um, index is that it carved out the information around Black women, around wealth. Because again, wealth is normally uh, achieved through home ownership and um, owning a business. And Black women only represent 7.7% of women-owned businesses in the state. And many of those businesses are micro enterprises. So those are some of the things that we're looking to do is um, create tools, projects, and initiatives, as well as partnerships to be able to strengthen the wealth gap. We feel like if we could get Black women on a financial path to success, then we can um, also elevate some of the other issues that are impacting them. And then the other, the last thing that we really do and the data helps us do this is identify intersectional work for greater impact. And that is through collaborations and partnerships, but also um, ensuring that we understand that our ultimate goal is to impact the lives of Black women and girls and be unapologetic about impacting the lives of Black women and girls. Because we really look at it in, in terms of if you lift up Black women and girls, you lift up all women. Um, but if you ignore Black women and girls, you end up you know, losing a population of women or females in the state that actually have the same needs as other women of color. Next slide. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Kelly, um, and to all of our speakers. And now we have moved into the questions and discussion part of the panel, uh, the webinar. And um, 
So uh, we have received some questions from all of, some of you who are participating. And um, the first one I'm going to start with is something that Kelly um, began to address in her remarks around the w wealth gap for African-American women in particular in terms of home ownership, business ownership, and also the healthcare. Um, but just to go a little bit deeper on that, uh, this is a question to any one of uh, Danielle or Noreen or Kelly. If you had to pick one thing, what would you say is the biggest barrier to wealth for communities of color and for women of color in particular? And so I invite you to come back through your cameras and, and audio uh, and respond to that question. I Danielle, think I think you're on mute. There you go. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yep, go ahead. Yeah. The the I think you know my knee jerk reaction, honestly, hearing you know what is the biggest um, obstacle to women of color obtaining and securing wealth? It's 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 racism. It's oppression. You know, and I think I I heard that named several times, maybe implicitly during the webinar, but whether it's in explicit or implicit, whether it's intended or not intended, you know, this country, we we are founded on stolen labor and genocide. And so to act like that, that still doesn't impact our economic opportunities down the road when, you know, you're, you're basically standing on, you know, your parents' uh, shoulders and whatnot, it, it, you, you can't pull that apart. And so I think, you know, I'm glad to hear that the index and the foundation and other organizations out there are confronting, you know, these real issues uh, and how they impact our economic opportunities. Thank you, Danielle. Kelly or Noreen, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I would add, you know, I think what we thought 50 years ago was access was going to uh, mean um, equity, and it did not. And so I think along the years, we have been focused on access when we really need to focus on equity and redefining what equity means particularly for women of color, matters. So we could start with equity, um, when we say pay equity, well, black women, particularly and Latino women, pay equity is behind uh, white women. So we start talking about equity from, and we always use the 75, and as the new data is showing, 79 cent. But by doing that and starting the narrative that way, we miss the people behind us, which are the women of color. And so we need to really have a real conversation about what equity means and how equity is also important within the, our own gender norms. So equity is not just about race, equity is also about women. And so with even if women are moving forward and you still are leaving women populations behind, then we truly are not achieving equity. I, I mean, thank you. Noreen, anything to add? You know, due to all that, and I think that what, um, what you know, Kelly's presentation especially talked about, and I think the index really reflects this, is that this is a systemic problem. This is a systems problem. And so if you, if you exclude women of color, especially from um, retirement savings, if they are, if the cost of them borrowing money to build a home is, you know, far more than it would be for me. These are ways which, where in which people don't not only have um, homes to leverage and, and build credit, but when things happen, like they happen to all of us, it just throws them further into debt. And so I think really, I love this, you know, this, this, this systemic approach and the look at all the ways that these are contributing to um, the inability of many people in this state and country to build wealth is really, really critical. And having policy recommendations that reflect that um, is powerful because the wealth conversation doesn't happen. The income side does, but the wealth doesn't. And um, I think that this is going to be a really big focus of our agenda in the next two years. Great. Thank you so much. Um, it's really such an important um, part of the conversation around economic security and justice to talk about how much women own in addition to how much women are able to earn. So thank you for those responses. Another question that came through is that on the, on the issue of equal pay and the pay gap and the bill that was mentioned earlier by Senator Jackson, SB 1284, um, 
what will it take for this to pass and where is the opposition? Uh, I'll, Any I'll come back on. I'll come yeah. back on for that. Um, I think I think and you know this is a this bill by the way one thing I didn't and Senator Jackson didn't mention is this bill is really also in a direct response to what's happening at the federal level in which um, the Trump administration is um, pulling back on pay data collection by federal agencies. So this is it makes this critically important um, as we we, we want to make sure that California becomes an example for other states. So at least we get statewide protection. Um, you know the the, the the pushback that we get we tend to get is from um, certain members of the employee employer sector who say that collecting this kind of data is is burdensome. Um, but we also have really great corporate um, you know examples like Salesforce of people that have voluntarily collect this kind of data, do their own internal audits. Um, and so we're we're definitely trying to highlight those high road employers that are showing that it's it's really important. It's it's easier to collect data and cor and correct problems than facing a lawsuit from an organization like mine because we make it really painful. So we're trying to um, create incentives and really show the positive sides of, of internal um, soul searching and data review by by certain uh, by by all employers. I think that the biggest uh, I, I don't see huge opposition except for from the employment community. But like I said, I think we've got a couple of really good employer leaders that are helping our cause. Great, thank you, Noreen. Um, Okay, next question from the audience. Uh, we still have hundreds of people uh, on the webinar. Uh, is there anything you can say about the difference in earnings between women who attend post-secondary education and those who do not? Um, one of the things I can say is that as it relates to black women is that black women with bachelor's degree earn less than white women with um, high school diplomas. And so um, for us, you know, we tend to go to college, um, but because of the achievement gap, we see some barriers and obstacles around um, where we start in college, how long it takes us to get out of college, and then also um, the debt that we come out of college, which, which is also another barrier to wealth, because if you're coming out of uh, we're more likely to take loans, we're more likely to take loans that are probably not um, the best um, interest rate loans, more private loans, um, because we need um, more support and there's usually not a lot of family support. And then when we come out, we have to pay all those back, which also is why you kind of see low um, single um, black women owning homes, because it takes us a lot longer to um, get through the loan process um, and paying those back uh, once we graduate. And we're more likely to come out and make less money than any other group of women. Yeah, and I would just note that Senator Hannah Beth Jackson actually you know, touched on this very briefly, and she noted that um, even when women do earn degrees and um, even professional degrees, like a law degree or a doctorate, they're often still pay less than men at lower levels of educational attainment. And we can say that as women as a whole, if they get a certificate or a degree, then they do, they do boost their income, but that doesn't mean that it erases the wage gap by any means. Yeah, and just to piggyback on that, it's actually the case that women, the pay gap um, increases for women as they get more degrees. So as they get into higher pay uh, uh, professions, the pay gap percentage actually increases, um, which is a, a huge issue, obviously. And every single industry, except for, I believe, shoe shining, there is a pay gap. <laughs> we have options. We can go become shoe shiners, I guess. <laughs> Wow, okay. <laughs> None of that really makes good sense at all. Um, okay, moving on to the next question. Uh, what does the panel make of the fact that Latinx women have worse wage gap, but yet the, the wealth gap is better for them than for black women, which is an interesting, um, interesting question in terms of the data. Any responses there? Go ahead, David. Yeah, I would say that it's probably due to the compacting um, impact of 
everything that the black community has gone through. And while, you know, maybe right now the income, which is much more flexible, right? And um, in the moment than wealth, which is an accumulation over time, you know, let's see how the demographic trends continue on. And we may be seeing an adjustment in Latinx women um, being at the bottom of the step when it comes to disaggregating that information. But kind of just when we've been talking about the compacting effects of racism and other factors, um, I would say that, that I would most likely um, think that it was contributed to that. I would also add that, um, as I mentioned, around Black women being single head of households and primary breadwinners, that there's no other resources coming in to be able to obtain wealth. So if you're trying to buy a home and you, and you have a quarter of our populations that are in service level positions, or there's um, barriers to down payment, um, because you are you're spending so much of your funds on just basic living necessity, housing, child care, if you're in church tides. Um, so, you know, wealth is achieved through home for most people or is achieved, achieved through home ownership. Um, and when you only have one single source of income, that becomes a barrier to getting that. And so when you start looking at overall wealth, $300 is absolutely shows that. Um, we do not have um, things that are driving our wealth up, which is why we have to stop, change that narrative around pay gap to really wealth gap in order to improve the quality of life of Black women and girls in California. And I would just add a, a bit about the data here and that we don't have great sources of wealth data. And so that that survey data that we used for the, the building wealth issue brief is actually national figures and the home ownership and business ownership data and um, pretty much every other data point is for California specific. And so that might also explain things a bit more clearly as well. If we were able to dig down into California's population, we might see different trends. Great, thank you. And then one final question uh, before we wrap up the webinar. This is a question about the, the official poverty measure, which is the basis that many analyses of economic well-being, including the California Women's Well-Being Index, um, take the, the measure from. So are there important takeaways when we look at measures of economic well-being that take account of cost of living, like the new federal supplemental poverty measure? So that's a great point. And um, you're right, the official poverty measure is widely considered to be inadequate in creating a threshold for how families are faring. It's one doesn't vary geographically. It's uniform across the entire United States. And it's based on um, food costs from the 1960s. That's just been adjusted over time. And it's just widely considered to not be a great measure. However, the data for using the official poverty measure is really useful and there's utility because it doesn't vary geographically. I can then use it at the county level. Whereas when you use the supplemental poverty measure, which does vary geographically, or even the California poverty measure, which varies geographically, you can um, see different, le different levels, but those thresholds don't always align with county level boundaries. And so it, it's more of a methodological trick than it, there is um, a preference, if that helps. That is helpful. Thank you, Kristen. Um, so we just have a couple more minutes left, and we did have one more question come in, and I'm going to uh, wrap us up with this one, which is, what role does immigration status play in some of these economic disparities? So I'd invite any of you that have a response to that question. What role does immigration status play in some of these economic disparities? Um, I could just uh, answer in the sort of more narrow piece of my expertise and invite other people to join in. But certainly for all of our workplace justice issues, um, you know, our clients who are undocumented have far less ability or willingness to try to vindicate their rights um, with respect to pay discrimination, sexual harassment, paid family. Um, of course, many are um, often excluded 
um, from, um, from protections altogether. Um, we also know that there are industries in which um, immigrant women predominate, like domestic work and agricultural work, which, um, you know, without our strong efforts are actually excluded from fair pay protections by statutes. So that's important um, work of the Domestic Worker, California Domestic Worker Alliance um, and others to make sure that um, both documented and undocumented workers in these workplaces are not excluded and have vehicles to vindicate their rights. And I would just add that the data sources that we use Great, for the index you. include both documented and documented individuals, doesn't distinguish. And so we are, we are seeing, um, you know, the data you see includes both populations. And not only are locked out of some of like the equal pay laws, but they're also locked out of many um, public systems and supports that help families make ends meet. And so um, they struggle in that regard as well. Great, thank you so much. Um, and that is bringing us to the end of our time. I wanna thank all of our speakers um, for taking time out of their day to be with us today. Um, and to all of the attendees, the hundreds of people that registered for this webinar and um, participated. And so to wrap up, I just wanna um, point you to the California Women's Wellbeing Index, ask you to use it, ask you to be in touch with us um, if you have questions about it. We have the new briefs that you heard about today from Kristen, uh, and we'll be following up with an email that will go out with all the materials. Um, and then our, you know, to leave you with a call to action, which is to use this uh, index, but also to um, support it in various ways. Uh, so you can do that by continuing to dig deeper and build on the index's existing data, the wealth, um, the wealth gap information came to us when we rolled it out in 2016 and people asked us um, to include that data. And so we worked hard to do that over the last couple of years. And finally, the final call to action is to support the index in any way that you can. And certainly um, we welcome your financial support both at the California Budget and Policy Center and at the Women's Foundation of California so that we can continue updating the index so that we can continue disseminating the data and the, the findings and the analysis, um, and also to continue to expand the data, the data in the index. So I thank you all for joining us today uh, and look forward to learning how you will be using this information in your work as you move forward. Thank you so much.